Thank you very much for, for being here. Uh, my name is Louise Arbour. I am the President and Chief Executive Officer of International Crisis Group. Uh, as I look around the room, I see uh, many board members and many repeat offenders um, of the global briefing. Many of you obviously know our work very well. Uh, some are relative newcomers. So what I want to say is that in the course of today and tomorrow, you will have an opportunity to interact with crisis group staff and board members, and I'm sure that you'll get an excellent insight into who we are and how we work. So rather than describe to you here our mission and our methodology, I would rather take this opportunity to try to share with you some personal thoughts that I've developed over the four years that I've been in this current position as well as in my previous uh, work in all kinds of different but related capacities. Now, it's, I'm sure it's well known to all of you that our work at Crisis Group is geographically based rather than thematic. Uh, as you will uh, get in the course of this global briefing, a very good exposure to the breadth of our geographic work and to the widespread of detailed views and opinions on the evolution of conflict in the regions and countries that we cover, I want to turn to a slightly different um, perspective today. What we do less often is to remove ourselves from this intensely contextual approach to reflect on the state of ideas and institutions that play a more global role in the management of conflict, and in the advancement of peace and security. Many of these ideas and institutions actually feature regularly in our work, but not always explicitly, and usually they feature through the lens of a single conflict or crisis. So allow me to try to look at events over recent years um, to try to see how they tell us something about the state of these doctrines and ideas and institutions. So I'd like to look briefly at four issues. One is the pursuit of international criminal justice, a field in which I've uh, worked previously in other capacities. The second one is the responsibility to protect, or R2P, as it's uh, usually well known, with which, of course, Crisis Group has been long associated, particularly uh, through the work of Gareth Evans. Finally, I'd like to look at peacekeeping, or perhaps what should be better called now peace enforcement missions in the UN system. And finally, and this is a pet issue of mine, I'd like to look at the international promotion of the rule of law. Uh, all of these were embraced, I think these ideas, albeit with more or less enthusiasm, uh, in this still relatively new post-Cold War era as desirable investments in the promotion of international peace and security. But by tomorrow evening, when we finish surveying the state of what I'm sure will appear to you as a rather unpeaceful world, I'd like you to ask themselves to what extent do you really believe that these doctrines and institutions have actually delivered? And if you think that the answer is not quite enough, well then I think it's gonna be important for us collectively to pause and ask ourselves why. Why are we falling short on our ideas and institutions? Working as we are on some of the most difficult, volatile, and war-torn parts of the world, this two-day briefing risks leaving you, as it has, I'm afraid, in the past, with a very bleak impression and possibly with a sense of doom. And I certainly don't want to add to that. Not all is negative, of course. The peace process in Colombia that we will address in a panel later this afternoon, the top-down reforms that were launched in Myanmar um, in the course of the last couple of years, uh, potentially positive changes happening in Iran and particularly on the, uh, the uh, nuclear negotiations. I think there are many examples. Uh, the first handover of a democratic uh, uh, electoral process in Pakistan they are some good news. So as I begin to highlight what I view as the shortcomings of existing frameworks for conflict prevention, I want to stress that some of it is actually working and that what is not working is fixable. But if we refuse to take a critical look at ideas and institutions that we have championed for fear uh, of seeing these modest gains unravel, the whole uh, uh, model might, might actually collapse.
So let me first turn to international criminal justice, which is now anchored, as you know, in a decade of work by the International Criminal Court. Now we all repeat the mantra that there can be no lasting peace without justice. And that's true enough, but I don't think that we have yet resolved the inevitable tensions between peace and justice in a really workable fashion. Security Council referrals to the International Criminal Court, in my opinion, are very problematic. Two referrals by the Security Council to the ICC in the cases of Darfur and Libya, respectively, have done very little to enhance the standing and the credibility of the ICC, the International Criminal Court, let alone contribute to peace and reconciliation in their respective regions. Last week, the judges of the ICC, at the request of the government of Libya, ruled um, one of the two Libyan cases inadmissible, clearing the way for President Gaddafi's spy chief, Abdullah al-Sanusi, to be tried in Libya, where investigations are already underway. Now, as you know, there have been talks about the Security Council referring Syria to the ICC amidst the general sense that first, it will not happen anytime soon, and second, that even if it did, it probably would do very little to advance a mediated end to the war, which currently appears the only even remotely feasible way of ending that fighting. So the Security Council's actions in response to allegations of human rights violations in Sudan and Libya is also in stark contrast to its deafening silence in the face of equally shocking, credible allegations of gross violations of human rights and international humanitarian, humanitarian law by government forces in Sri Lanka, where the last few months of the war in 2009 saw tens of thousands of civilians killed in indiscriminate attacks. It's true that Security Council referrals expand the reach of accountability to countries that have chosen not to be parties to the Rome Statute that established the ICC. But they do so at a cost that any justice system should find very difficult to bear. Three permanent members of the Security Council are not party to the statute that created the court, and all five permanent members can, of course, use their veto to shelter themselves and their friends from this expansion of responsibility. Indeed, Security Council Resolution 1970, which referred the Libya case to the ICC, specifically excluded nationals of states not parties to the Rome Statute from the ICC's jurisdiction, Americans, for example, except, of course, Libyan nationals. So, in my view, so much for the rule of law, which is premised fundamentally on the idea of equality before the law. Security Council referrals expose the court to charges of politicization while providing the court with no compensatory benefits such as additional financial, operational, or political support. And in the end, council referrals um, may in fact underscore the court's impotence rather than enhance its alleged deterrent effect, given that in Darfur, Security Council backing has achieved very little while in Libya, <coughs> there is a sense, <coughs> sorry, in some quarters, that the court withdrew from a contentious arena, leaving the indictees to be tried in a judicial system, frankly, under pretty severe stress. Another serious challenge to the court is the emerging election of Uhuru Kenyatta and William Ruto as respectively president and vice president of Kenya, after having been indicted by the ICC, and their sub subsequent efforts to drum up opposition to the court in Africa. The two cases are casting, the two, sorry, these two leaders are casting their elections as evidence of national reconciliation that they say their trial would compromise. This, of course, conveniently obscures the failings of the Kenyan system, which permitted indicted criminals to stand for public office but it highlights the reality of post-conflict environments where justice can be brandished as a further threat to peace. And finally, we will discuss in more detail this afternoon the tension between the objective of peace and justice in the negotiations currently taking place in Havana between the Colombian government and the FARC, and we'll get back to that this afternoon.
So recent events, whether Security Council referrals, the difficulty that the court faces in Africa, or its balancing act in the, Colum in the Columbia case, appear to challenge the assumption underlying the international justice enterprise that holding military and political leaders accountable for war crimes would actually contribute to peace by deterring such conduct in the future and by encouraging national reconciliation. This is not to say that we should abandon the fight against impunity. And there is no question, in my view, that we must support the court. But it means that we need to be more strategic about the convergence of justice with the resolution of armed conflict. And this, in my view, cannot be done by either peace or justice trumping the other, as in effect would be the case if we're, we're, one were to approach it by a sequencing uh, strategy. But rather, it should be done by seeking, in every single case, an outcome that maximizes both. And this, in turn, requires compromise. Both sides, the justice and the peace advocates, have to be prepared to yield. Many justice advocates, however, are wary of losing grounds and are unwilling to support this kind of approach. An alternative, creating a model whereby the political and justice tracks are parallel rather than crisscrossing, in my view, remains out of reach, although it has considerable appeal. Now let me turn to R2P, I think a doctrine that's very familiar uh, to most of you, a doctrine that um, uh, reflects a modern articulation of state sovereignty as entailing not just states' rights, as long assumed, but also the responsibility of states to look after the welfare of their citizens. That's the first aspect of the doctrine. And secondly, it offers a framework for intervention in the domestic affairs of a state, including through military action, in order to prevent mass atrocities. Despite early attempts to focus on prevention by all means short of the use of force, in reality, the debate over R2P has focused mostly on its sharp end, how to mobilize international support for using military force against a government unwilling or unable to protect its own people. Combined with some dysfunctions in the Security Council, to put it very diplomatically, the doctrine has become hostage to politics and actually to public opinion. It was designed to mitigate the harm to civilians caught in war. But in Libya, it was instrumentalized also to affect a change of regime. Now, whether this showed the potency of the doctrine or will lead to its demise is unclear. Since then, though, the doctrine has proved useless in mobilizing the international community to protect civilians in Syria, where, as you know, well over 100,000 people have been killed, most, uh, uh, many of them civilians. In fact, it may even be part of the problem. Some Security Council members have been reluctant to pass any resolution on Syria, claiming to fear that it could then be stretched to justify military action. Still, in my view, the idea of using external force to prevent atrocities con continues to have currency. It is, in fact, a legal requirement, a requirement of international law under the widely ratified Genocide Convention. It recently led the French Foreign Minister Laurent Fabius to call on Security Council veto holders to undertake voluntarily not to use their veto to prevent actions designed to stop mass atrocities, with, of course, the not insignificant caveat that they should feel no such restraint when their national interests are at stake a pretty significant uh, caveat. R2P was articulated as a humanitarian doctrine, not as a conflict resolution one. Whether it can ever be purely the former remains to be seen. Once Gaddafi was declared a murderous threat to Libyans, how could the NATO intervention have ended in any way other than by regime change? A failure to explicitly recognize this fact opens the doctrine up inevitably to politicization that will render its utility, I suggest, very questionable in the short to medium term. Third, let me say a few things about peacekeeping. I suspect that there are more blue helmets deployed today than maybe at any other time in UN history. UN peacekeepers have undoubtedly played a critical role in moving many societies from war to peace. 
Over recent years, however, their responsibility has changed almost beyond recognition, with perhaps the most dramatic shift being from peacekeeping to peace enforcement, peace building, peace making. The, uh, and let me give you some examples. The newly deployed so-called intervention brigades in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The somewhat ambiguous environment in which the UN is deploying in Mali and the latest calls by the UN Secretary General for more and more robust troops to take on al-Shabaab in Somalia may herald a new era at the UN of peacemaking by warfare. This is particularly troublesome in my view it, as the UN deployed missions are often required to side with governments of questionable legitimacy. And the weaker these governments are to become, or are, or are becoming, the more the strong arm of the UN will be called upon to prop them up. In this emerging configuration, the structural drivers of conflict, such as poverty, marginalization, rising extremism, resource disputes, and so on, risk being further neglected. In addition, let's remember the call that was expressed by Lagdar Brahimi years ago, that UN missions should have the means commensurate to their mandates. That call has never been fully implemented. Mandates express ambitious protection of civilian agenda, while troop contributing countries are wary of putting their forces in harm's way to do just that. Given also the military vigilantism of drone strikes and special forces operation, that the second decade of the war on terror has sought to legitimize, there are reasons to be concerned about the increasing appeal to the use of force in the pursuit of peace and uh, its stretch, its, its search, pardon, for legitimacy, including in obviously very wary public opinions. Let me turn to the rule of law. Crisis Group has written extensively on the importance of building rule of law institutions in fragile and conflict affected states. The link between the rule of law and armed conflict, particularly internal armed conflicts, the most common form today, could not be better expressed in my view than it was in the preamble of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Let me quote, whereas it is essential if man is not to be compelled to have recourse as a last resort to rebellion against tyranny and oppression, that human rights should be protected by the rule of law. Now, rule of law institutions are important, and the development agenda, I think, has long neglected them, even under the heading of governance. In most conflict-prone areas, we spend, for instance, much more money and political capital on elections and support for the executive than on the establishment of a competent, professional, and independent judiciary. This is true from Afghanistan to the DRC in Somalia, in Guatemala, Sri Lanka, and the Central uh, Asian republics. Weak or corroded judicial systems are both a product of crisis and a sign of crisis to come. There's also a tendency to conflate the concept of the rule of law with the security sector. We do invest in, in developing the capacity of police and militaries, but we should guard against pretending that this is what the rule of law is mostly about. Law enforcement is not a bad thing in and of itself. And actually, it tends to be very popular uh, with, actually particularly with, authoritarian regimes, as long as there are no constraints imposed on them about the content of these laws. But understood properly and substantively, the rule of law expresses the requirement of equal benefit and equal protection of the law, which is embodied in Lacordaire's famous insight, and I quote, that between the rich and the poor, between master and servant, between the strong and the weak, it is freedom that oppresses and the law that sets free. It's very difficult to get any traction on recommendations that call for such a substantive and long-term investment in conflict prevention, mitigation, and resolution. But short of pressing for such fundamental policy engagement in countries at risk, our work will mimic that of Sisyphus pushing that rock up the mountain. Again, I don't want to leave you with this image of any futility in our efforts, quite the opposite. I think it's only by acknowledging the inadequacies of our approach that we have any chance of improving them. 
as the U.S. prepares to pull out of Afghanistan, uh, there will be a so-called lessons learned exercise about that wasteful decade. Throughout that decade, we have published extensively on the need to invest in the long-term effort to build rule of law institutions in Afghanistan. As others are calling for a repudiation of short-termism in addressing the defining issues of our time, such as climate change and economic inequalities, so it is in the field of conflict prevention. So I will leave you with this invitation. Do keep in mind over the next two days that events um, each year expose new weaknesses and contradictions in the very doctrines and institutions, the tools we have for conflict management. To identify them is not to dismiss these tools altogether. They have, for the most part, and despite their shortcomings, they have been um, uh, sources for positive change but rather we should encourage further thinking on how to fine tune them and use them more wisely to advance peace and security. Thank you very much for your attention and I think we will be ready now to turn for our prominent uh, panel and I'll inv invite the panelists to join me here. Thank you very much. <laughs>